Hey, what's going on, everybody? And welcome to another episode of Legacy's Journey, where we talk about creating what outlives you. I'm your host, Cameron Williams, owner of Kinley Consulting, where we focus on strategic financial growth for marketing agencies so that they can live the dream life they deserve and not be a slave to their business. And we do that through accounting, consulting, CFO services, tax strategy, you name it. Now, this is season two. And y'all know, season two, we wanted to do it big. So I had to put my feelers out there. I'm like, hey, I need y'all to tell me some great people that we can have on that are doing this at a high level that can give the audience the value, that can share their journey to the million dollar stage or to, to leaving a legacy for their family and how they're doing that. So, you know, we had to put some feelers out. And there was this one person that I was like, oh, man, they're pretty dope. And then started talking to him and she said, I, she sent me this website and y'all, this website was like the definition of polish. So we started talking and I'm basically like, look, come on the podcast, please. So she was like, all right, cool. Send me the link. We got a book. So everybody, Mrs. Mandy is in the building. Thank you so much for having me, Cameron. I appreciate that. All right. Now tell the people, so, so tell them name name of the company, how long you've been doing this, and what specifically do you help your clients do? All right. So my name is Mandy Ellison, and I am the founder of The Hands-Off CEO. And we also work with agencies and consulting companies to be able to triple their fees, free up 10 extra hours per week to focus on growth, and unlock millions of dollars of profitable growth. And um, we've been in business for, this is our 12th year in business. And uh, I think, did I answer all your questions there, Cameron? You did. And we already got something to jump into. Okay. Now, so let's talk about this. Because, okay, we hear all the time people are like, oh, you know, I'm going to help people make more money or I'm going to save them more money. You're saying, hey, I'm a 3X, not just double. Not just you make a lot. I'm a 3X it. Tell the people, like, how are you helping your clients specifically to do that? Like, yeah. what makes Mandy just so unique that she can guarantee that? Yeah. So um, here's the thing is we don't actually guarantee tri tripling the fees because it's not right for all companies, tripling the fees. We guarantee 100% happiness guarantee. And we used to guarantee a 5X ROI guarantee. And... Um, we have found that we just attract in the better clients when we stick to our ROI guarantee. We have an ROI guarantee within uh, a certain period of time uh, and um, that, are, that they follow our process. They're going to get an ROI. And that happens within um, the first four months when we work together with our clients. But um, back to your question about tripling fees. So um, as you understand how that works with, with fees is that, Let's imagine you're you are uh, charging ten thousand dollars for a service and it has a ten percent profit margin. You know you have uh, you get a thousand dollars of profit, right? Now, um, if you increase that just ten percent increase in the fee, you've doubled your profit, right? Because it's another thousand dollars. Did I get my math right on that, Cameron? I am indeed agreeing that the math was correct. All right, so. You can see that even with this very small price increase, and I, I'm sure this is something that you do with your clients as well, Cameron, but even with a very small price increase, you can have dramatic improvements in profits. So one of the things that we have found with our clients is that, you know, they're, they're oftentimes at this stage where they're in the earlier seven figures and they need to hire a manager. They need to be, or maybe they have a manager who they need to upskill. Um, they need to be able to put in place, you know, new marketing systems and they need to be putting in place um, new team members to exit themselves out of it. So that, anyway, there's, they're scaling their company and it costs money, right? It takes cash to do that. So how do you be able to, to invest more cash in your, in your company in a way that you know that it's going to be profitable? Well, you need, you, what you need is a new model and you need, you, you need a new model. And um, one of the things that we find is, is that for some companies, all they can do is uh, are small price increases, and that's that's the right fit for their business. Uh, and um, 
the challenge with the small price increases is that clients can have a feeling of like, well, you just increase the price on me, but what, what else do I get from this? And it can create a, a feeling of a frustration here that they're paying more for the same. So um, what we do is we look at, well, how can we innovate this service? How do we go after the, this? Who is this profit sweet spot client who is willing to pay the top dollar? Who and, and the reason why is because they have such a painful problem that it's costing them millions of dollars, this problem, them not having this solved. And your outcome is what allows them to be able to create such a bigger, such, such a bigger um, transformation in their company that they're they're very happy to pay a lot higher price point for those services. So um, that that what that does is that it avoids some of that um, that drop off that can happen when you increase your your prices and your clients don't understand why they should be paying more. That ha that's what happens a lot of times and. Um, you know, the, the companies that are providing more of a, a a really simple type of, uh, where we offer these deliverables, you pay us this price point, Incre increasing pro increasing the, the, the price point is, it's probably the only way you can really do it is that way. It's like the small incremental. But when you recreate what you're doing around your top 5% of your clients, you look at who is who is getting the very best types of results. How could we bring on more of these types of clients? But then also looking at like how could we expand that? Who should we be working with? What is the best case for uh, like what is the, the best use case for our services such that we could add another zero onto what we're doing? Add another zero onto the outcomes that we can create for our clients, and add another zero onto the kind of fees and and that we can command. And when you're doing that. Now, all of a sudden, you're able to do about the same work for a lot more, which, I mean, as you understand, Cameron, this, this can increase your, your uh, profit margins per client 500% or more. Okay, now, y'all, I told y'all we're going to get the best people. You see how she, it just came out of her just so easy. You see what I'm saying? Let me break this down for y'all. So, essentially, what she's getting at, is because like you said, we have helped our clients with this. Everybody can't get a price increase because to your point, just human psychology is like, if you're doing the same thing, why are you charging me more money? But to one of the key things that she focused on was who is the proper avatar that can hold or handle this price increase? So just to use easy numbers, if, if we were selling a 5K package, well, yeah, that's one thing. But okay. Is it that this client on average makes 50 grand a month? Well, okay, if we want to do a $7,500 package, do they now need to be making 75 or 75,000 or 80,000 a month? Now, where there'll be fewer, maybe, but you just made an extra 2,500 grand and you're still doing the same types of prospecting. You just may have to get in different circles or different groups or different rooms, but that same service that you were doing, all you did was change the number and found a better client. So there are multiple ways to increase this, right? And then she also talked about, we, sometimes we got to cut these expenses. We got to slice them up a little bit because sometimes we're just bloated. Like I was literally talking to a buddy um, yesterday, a fellow accountant, and he found out, you're going to love this one, by the way. He says that he found out he had an employee that was still in time when they were supposed to be working hourly, but for whatever reason, they were billing him for 40 hours. A week. But he's like, mm -hmm. they only have this super small amount of clients, enough to count on one hand um, that he gave to them and that they should have only been working like 10 to 15. And so in a case like that, it's like you said, one way we can just increase profit margins is our team at capacity. Are they working the right amount of hours because we're having to pay them for that time that they may just be sitting on a clock. So it's important to always to do the things that she's referring to. Like we got to look at both sides. Yes, we want to add more money. We want to charge more, but we don't want to be bloated and just carrying people just because. Can we give them new tasks, new outcomes? Can we merge some responsibilities to get them to be more efficient or to be a better, more efficient flowing company? Don't you, you agree? Yeah, you know, I do agree. And, and here's the thing is, I think that that this ties into it, what, what you're saying exactly, that when you're really clear on that profit sweet spot client 
and what problem you're solving for them, what you've done is you've eliminated all the other dozen of, of different problem sets that other companies come to you and say, hey, I want you to do Facebook ads. I want you to do um, LinkedIn. I want you to do all these different things. And, and maybe you're maybe you're doing that, but but then you have companies that are manufacturing companies and then companies that are B2B um, services. And then you have, so you have all these different types of variables that make it really difficult to systematize it and, um, and have any repeatability around. Um, so when, you, when you're running into that, that comes with a lot of waste and it comes with people not being clearly focused on what's gonna actually make the biggest difference for the company. And it's one of the things that keeps the CEO very stuck in the day to day is that variability. But the problem is, is that you need the, the, the reason why the variability is there <clears throat> is because most of most of the work is sold via referral. So what that means is that whatever business comes in is what shows up on your door. So it, so then that that contributes to a very wide types of a type of client base and. Um, that's very difficult to scale. And that very thing that's keeping them stuck in the business is what's actually keeping them also um, away from creating a, a, a clear, consistent sales and marketing process that is going to be bringing in more of their profit sweet spot clients. Because if you think about your top 5% of your clients, how much easier is that to scale? If, you, if your whole business is chock full of your very best types of clients, those are the ones that tend to be the easiest ones to work with, right? Yeah, like in our case, like I'm thinking about my favorite people. They're my favorite, not just because they pay the most, but they tend to be the most attentive. They take full advantage of the service. Um, they're re pretty responsive and they're actually getting value and they understand that they're getting value and they trust us to give them that. So, yeah, we could just have a bunch of those. What? That's the thing is that they're, they're partnering with you. If they've, they've spent enough, they understand the big picture. And I think that your service is actually a really good example of. Um, yeah, let's use me. I'll be the avatar today. Okay, no, she's going to use me I, to show y'all how yeah. she do her magic. Well, we're not, I'm not going to sit here and break everything apart too much. But I, I will just say one thing I noticed, though, is that you've chosen a target market. So now as it because you've chosen a target market. You've, you've looked inside to see who else in the industry is serving the same markets. And now you can create channel partnerships. Now you can create a whole opportunity of referrals so that there, I mean, there's just one thing right there. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, um, now, now, uh, <clears throat> if I was going to go in and refer one of our agencies over to, to, um, a financial partner, I, I'm going to choose the one that understands agencies over one that doesn't. Right. So like, that's going to be a pretty short list of people. Right. Yeah. So, so that there's that, there's that one piece, but something else that you're doing is also is really interesting with, with, with your, with your company is that you're, um, you're not just coming in and saying, Hey, we're going to be your bookkeeper or, Hey, I'm going, we're going to, um, to, to look at your, look at your P and L and give you your, your reports every month. And, and we're going to be the fractional CFO. But most of the time, when you hear the term fractional CFO, that person doesn't even know what that is. They, like, I mean, they don't know how to talk about that. That's so crazy. They're not looking at the business holistically. Correct. So you're looking at the business holistically. You're looking at what their goals want. They, they all say they do this. They all say they do this. But actually, the I, I observed your website and the way you're showing up is you're you're holistically looking at the business instead of being the bean counter who just says no, which by the way are some of the worst people in your company that are just going to slow you down what she said and it's funny you said that because i just talked about that uh this past weekend because to your point like we did this whole exercise a person came in was talking about ops and i had pulled her to the side afterward and i was like i'm just making sure i was interpreting this right out of all of the, and she was doing it for agencies and out of all the positions she had, she had the C-suite. Well, she didn't even have that. She had like head of sales, heads of operations, um, the director, your team leads, et cetera. And I'm like, where's the CFO? And she was like, well, they probably wouldn't get a CFO if they're under seven figures. She says, but they're going to have a bookkeeper yeah. or a tax pro. And in my head, the first thing I started thinking about to your point is I've been positioning myself, at least from a marketing perspective, as fractional CFO. So to your point, 
that word can be so overused that it just, or people automatically disqualify you and say, oh man, I don't want to work with him because I don't need that. I just need somebody regular or whatever the case is. So wording is so important. How you're positioning yourself is so important. Are you niching down? And I mean, for us, like, I can't even tell you at the beginning how many different people we had that were financial advisors that would come in and be like, hey, you could also be a financial advisor and take your series six and all these other things and offer that. And I was like, nope, I want to be really, really, really good at two or three things, not average at 15. Because to your point, you're only going to slow down your growth. Your focus and attention is going to be spread out and maintaining too many things versus these are the two or three things we do really, really well. We consult at a super high level. We do tax strategy at a high level. And of course, we handle your accounting. That's it. We're not doing your your investments and 529 plans and insurance and like, no, that's let me ask you, wouldn't you say that that's probably one of the things that slow people down? From getting to that million dollar number? Um I would I definitely would say yes, but I'm I'm gonna say yes with a caveat because I also find that on the flip side, people going and streamlining too much, like the the uh the scaling systems of the world, I'll talk about you know, systematizing and, you know, making it repeatable. And basically what they're doing is they're saying, we just need to, to remove the CEO out of this. You know, that's the most, that's the part that's the, 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 the hardest to scale is just to remove the CEO and their expertise out of it. So what do you have left? You have some cogs and wheels. They're moving around a turn the crank kind of service that doesn't actually deliver a real transformation. So, so what it really comes down to is what does it take to elevate that transformation? So to, because here's the thing is it's actually not good enough to just to create the same level of transformation you're creating right now, because the same level of transformation you're creating right now with you involved in it, your clients are happy with, but in order for you to actually be able to sell that transformation and deliver that transformation completely without you, it's gotta be articulated and delivered at a whole, at a whole other level, because then you're going to be able to justifiably sell it. You're selling an outcome. You're, and, and maybe you're already delivering big enough transformations right now. And, it, and it's just about standardizing that. But what I find is, is that, and what our team has found is that there tends to be about 20% of client of, of uh, clients on, on your, within the business that, within an agency's company that is, um, that are getting really good transformations. And then, you know, about, you know, maybe 40% or so are getting okay results. And then everybody else is getting like, I don't know, poor results or they just don't know. So as a result, what happens is, is that the way that they see the transformations they can create for a client is, is really watered down and it's averaged. So then what happens is they, they go and and um and sell average. So when when the the uh potential client is like, well, <clears throat> well, what can you get for us? What 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 is this gonna do for our company? What they're really asking is is that if we invest this money with you, how is our company going to actually be quantifiably better at the end of this? That's what they're asking. They don't even know how to ask that question. They want to know, okay, I'm gonna give you this money, what am I gonna get at as a result? As, as, as a result of that. And almost no agencies can answer that. Our agencies can answer that. But, um, and the reason why is because they, they always have two words. It depends. It depends. Well, yeah, it depends on your price point. It depends on the, the, the client, the, the, the target market. It depends on their profit margins. It depends on their sales cycle. It depends on their marketing flow. It depends on all sorts of different things. But what if you just got to choose those variables? What if you just said, well, we're going to choose these conditions for our success and we're only going to work with those clients that have those success success conditions and we're going to create whatever other success conditions that we need to have to do our best transformation. And now what you've done is you have eliminated all the lower end clients. You do this over time. I'm not talking about like throwing the baby out of the bathwater. It gets transition, right? But <clears throat> then you can take your top 20%, top 5% of your clients, and then build and then fill up your business full of only your very best types of clients. 
And then what that what that does, the CEOs, they, they have so much more confidence. They have more confidence that, that they can sell it. Their team can deliver it. They have more confidence that they have something that they can actually have their team be able to sell at some point. Anyway, I've rambled on for a while here. <laughs> Not even giving you a word in edgewise, Cameron. This is, hey, this is your episode. You get to ramble all you want. You, as long, you're helping the <laughs> audience, but I think it's so important to, to I love it when my guests ramble because y'all get to see how smart they are. But to your point, it's just about, there's so much she said right there. <laughs> what she said, I don't even feel like I can say it better. It's just, what she said, we'll just leave it at that. Okay, let's keep going <laughs> okay. up. Now, one of the things, and if you guys can't see, because you may be listening to this on audio, if she moves slightly to her left, she has a book right behind her, The Hands Off CEO. So just to continue to drill this point home, this is not like she just tried this and it worked by accident. She's been doing this at a successful level for years and generating results. So can you tell us maybe what is your favorite, you may want to call it a case study, but client success story of where... You came in, like kind of described where they were as a business. Maybe they were at this general revenue area. You came in, instituted some things, and that's what got them to that million dollar mark. Because I think, as you would know, that million dollar agent is the buzzword right now. Everybody wants to get to the seven figure mark. And you have some people that are like, oh, it's easy. You have some people that are the people I end up talking to. It's not easy because of whatever fill in the blank things that are stopping them. So if you can, can you draw us out maybe a case study where, hey, I found them. They were like this. They were operating like this. We came in and we made these few suggestions, tweaks or whatever scenarios. And that's what helped them to make those different transitions to get to that seven figure. Right. Seven bigger. Yeah. Um, and you know, a lot of our clients, we work with that seven figure and multiple seven figure level. And some clients we do work with um, when they are, you know, half a million plus, um, because that they're really at the point where they can they can invest in their growth, right? Ooh, um, let's do two stories then, because I think what I've noticed okay. from having guests, the five hundred k to a million is one whole journey. The seven figure to eight figure is a completely different journey. It is. It, it actually, it's really great that you pointed that out, Cameron. And there's there's different stages, growth stages as you scale up. Did you? I don't know if you had a chance to read my book yet, but um, in chapter five, there's growth stages as you're scaling up, and there's different stages based on where you're at. And actually, Wait, show the people based the on that. you know, just in case they're watching the video, like show us the, yeah. the copy of the book. Bam. There's the book. Yeah. And there's a little chart here. There's a little chart here that shows the uh, the startup phase zero zero to twenty to two fifty the pit of death which is two fifty to five hundred absolutely terrible place to be at it's you want to get to the stage as fast as possible um, and uh, that's that's like that's like the first level of delegation by the way it's or, it's around there um, and then there's the mid six figure stall and I think this is what you're talking about you know between half a million and a million. And then there's a seven figure slump that happens between one and 3 million. I, there's different stages that go up to 10 million and beyond, but I'm just going to, we can just talk about those stages right here for the sake of this podcast. Okay. Um, and what, to, what to do to, to, to get past that. And I go into a lot more detail on this. We can't go into all this, but you can, you can uh, check out the book. It's like check. 9.99 on Kindle. If you want to buy a copy. Sure we link the book here. So that way you guys can have an easy way to just hit it, hit it, get to it. All right, so start at the pit of death. These companies are doing okay. what bad things that you have to come in and correct immediately. And y'all, yeah, so we don't have like to correct anything at the pit of death. I'm just the pit saying. of death, they're just listening to our podcast and they're like, we, we don't work with them at the pit of death because, um, well, they don't have the conditions of success for us to do our best work. And it's a whole, it's, it's so much work to get past that point. We just would prefer to that they already have gotten past. <laughs> Just, but wait, that, yeah. well, wait, wait, wait. I think this is a good point. Let's talk about the why, because right, yeah. like in being realistic, there are way more agencies out there making two hundred and fifty to five hundred than there are yeah. as bad figures. 
they're, so, and here's what has happening. It's okay. they're freelancers. They're they're freelancers that call themselves an agency, and um, they're they haven't really made the full on decision to scale yet. And that the one of the biggest things that's holding them back is like this like one foot in, one foot out type of thing. Now, here's the thing: is is that someone who's already had like a seven figure company, if they come in and start a new agency, they will they will blast past that zone so fast. Because they don't, because so much of what goes on there is head trash. Mm. And, um, wait, whoa, it's, whoa, whoa. it's just hard. Whoa, genius. Hold up. Okay. Head trash <laughs> being defined as. <laughs> it's just being defined as like all these stupid stories and you believing just this bull crap that goes through your head, not thinking you're good enough. All the, I, I, I can't afford this. I can't do this. I can't do that. And they're, they're money hangups that, their worthiness hangups. There's, but it's it's a lot of stuff that's the, the 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 game between the game to get to seven figures is very much a a mental game. Ooh, pause. pause. Which is why. Ooh. Okay. Y'all heard that. Now I just want to say it again for like the fifth time. This is somebody who's taken multiple companies, not two seven figures, but past it. So if she's telling you, in all, it's that serious to where she don't even work with people under 500 because of the head trash, the lack of self-doubt, all of those things. So I just don't want to depause you because yeah. I think. Well, yeah. And, and you know, actually, what, here's what I'll, I'll actually give an example of because I was trying to, I was thinking about which one should we get. Because actually, this is an example of one company we did work with, with before. They were bef- they were way before they were in the startup phase. They were actually had just started their consulting company. I had worked with the founder in another company, and like they're just great guys. So we brought them on. It was a risk. It was a risk bringing them on. But but um, anyway, so we we brought them on, and they were they were, went from a hundred thousand dollars of gross sales because they'd only been open for a few months to a million dollars. So they added they actually they added a million dollars on top of that. So they added a million dollars in twelve months. Now, um, impressive. Here's here's some of the things. What, what was that, Cameron? I just said that's impressive. Keep going. It is impressive, and this is an outlier example. Okay, so I'm not suggesting that every company that comes to work with us at that low of a stage is going to get to a million, and they're not going to. And the reason why is most of them won't because they're because they won't get over the, the mental barriers and things. And I'll tell you what, Josh and Marcello, they had to get over a lot of mental things to be able to to create that level of growth. They also had to. Um, they had to be, they had to be able to come up with ways, really creative ways to staff because, you know, they're working on these, you know, six figure type of engagements where the level of staff that they need to staff this for really high end, um, research projects there, it, it, it requires, they're like for the, the largest tech companies in the world. You think about the top three tech companies in the world and you know who, who they're working with. And they're competing though with Google, with Facebook, with those, all the tech companies for their very best talent. So we're looking at somebody who's getting paid two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars a year. How do you staff up your company when you don't even have that much money yet? Like, how do you staff up a company like that? Well, you got to get creative. It's what you have to do, right? You got to get creative, and this is something that we've seen many times. And and part of it is you have to be have this really big vision for what are you creating? And they had a vision of what they were creating. They're were, they were creating a multi-million dollar company. And actually that's, that's their vision is much, much larger than that. Now their visions they're, they're I hope they don't mind me mentioning that they're, but they're creating a hundred million dollar company right now. And um, shout out to those guys. But it, yeah. But it starts with looking at where do you actually want to be? And you, and you show up and you take actions aligned with, who that is. So they were taking actions in this case aligned with, um, you know, a few hundred, few million dollar C, a few million dollar company. So they're actually standing in that future as if it's already done there and taking, uh, and taking actions aligned with that. So what that looks like is that, well, you know, what is it going to take for us to be able to have staff that can help us fulfill on this work? So they were able to look in their network. They were able to, to, to find unique ways of being able to staff up and, um, they were fine. They were able to, to, to uh, I can't give the, the exact 
specifics on 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 how they broke things down there. I have another example I could give the specifics on, which we we've helped him go from six hundred thousand to now they're at te- uh, they're I don't know if I can say this, but they're 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 almost the eight the eight figures. As as and he was able to get from six hundred to two point one million in the, in the year in the first year. Okay, so this so we can help her get her <laughs> so she don't she don't tell on the client. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We'll just say in general, they're close to whatever number. All right. So zero to 25, 250. We're not even talking to them. You're 250 to 500 with me. Maybe most of our listeners may or may not fall into your problem is head trash, lack of belief in yourself, confidence, et cetera. Now, let's say they finally had that year. That's part of it. I'm going to add something else to that. The head trash is part of it. It's not even head trash. I'm not going to, it's a kind of oversimplified to say head trash. It's more about them not really wanting it bad enough. They're not having a big enough vision for it and not creating, not, not like, like they don't believe they can have it and they haven't really taken, they haven't really decided. That's really the problem is they haven't really decided that they want it. So once you actually make the decision, that's a whole different game. And now you're actually building a real seven figure company instead of saying you are. So, um, but the other part of this is you just have to be really good. You have to get good at delivering results. And part of how you get good at delivering results is you stop working with clients that you can't get results for. That's one of the biggest That's things fair. you can do. That's fair. But the thing is, is though, so many companies, they just sit, so many agencies, they just sit here. Uh, probably the most of them do this actually. And I'm not necessarily saying that everyone who's listening is doing this, but the, the, the lowest end agencies, they sit there and they wait for all that, like they, they're, they're opportunists, whatever comes their way, they take and say, yep, I can do this. Yep. I can do this. Yeah. Yeah. I can do this. And then what ends up happening is that they have a whole client roster full of mediocre, mediocre clients and their results are mediocre. And now you have, you can go, you have nothing to leverage to actually go and get new clients. Like you, know, you asked me for these, these case studies. I mean, I can literally tell you dozens of them. I just have to just even stop and think about it. We have a lot of them recorded on our podcast, on our website, but Ooh, wait, like, shout out your have, podcast. Um, shout out your podcast. Oh, it's a hands-off CEO podcast. So you can find you it on iTunes or wherever podcast. More of these case studies to hear, not even necessarily how she's helping them, but just kind of where they were versus where they are now. You need to go check it out. We, we don't mind spreading the love. Yeah. Well, thanks. And, and, um, Josh and Marcello, their whole story, we actually, they actually shared their whole story on our podcast. Um, Philip, who I was just mentioning, who's his scale, you know, from 600,000 to, you know, well over 5 million, like I was saying, well on his way to an eight figure company. Um, one of the things that he did with staff was that we, um, he thought he needed an engineer to be able to do it. Now this is, is a consulting agency. They have the exact same problems as an agency does. But um, he thought he needed a mechanical engineer. And, and um, where he lives in Canada, that would have been at least a six-figure type of position. He didn't have the cash flow to be able to hire that kind of position. So what we did is we, we broke it down and looked at, well, what is the actual level of skill in He's Like, well, they need to be an engineer, right? And I'm like, is that really true? So we start breaking it down and say, what is it that they actually need to do? And he's like, well, you know, they need to do all of this. So we actually broke it down and say, well, how would they make a decision based on these things? So we started making, looking at what are the, what are the main decision points on this? And we started breaking down the process and in a matter of, it was less than an hour, it was about a half hour, we were able to identify what decisions needed to be made at each one of these, these places with these very complex systems that they would manufacture. And, and um, that they would consult on. And what we found is, is that he's like, well, you know what? We're pro- maybe we don't need a, a we, Maybe we don't actually need a, a mechanical engineer. You know what? Maybe we just need like, like a, a plumbing expert, someone who understands how all these pipings, pipes work. And now we broke it down. He's like, you know what? Actually, you know what? Somebody with just, just basically a high school education would be able to do this. So it went from someone who's going to, it was going to cost them $100,000 a year, which they didn't have, which the equivalent of it would be well over 150 now, um, to somebody that is an entry-level worker. Now, I'm not saying that this process would fit, 
with every company in the same way. Most of the time, you're, you can't take someone that skilled and bring it back down. But he was able to use that to be able to generate more growth. He could hire someone, the right kind of person for, the, for that role that he, ha- that he could hire immediately. But it, had to, it came from having to think about the problem differently. And, that's, and, and in almost every case, companies, when they're trying to get to a seven figures, they're understaffed. And they're understaffed because they don't have the money to pay for staff. Makes sense. Now, um, and they don't have the, the money to pay for the staff because their their offers are not they're they're not compelling enough for the clients to pay what it act what it actually is going to cost them to deliver the service plus a lot more. Now, here's the thing: is is like when you actually do when you're able to have that compelling of an offer, you can actually it can actually cost more to deliver. You can actually spend more money delivering it and be able to still make a lot more money and profit because it costs more, but maybe you, you can, because you can command more. Uh, but let me go back to what I was saying about the staffing though. Um, because when you, you have that right offer, it gives you the cash flow to be able to hire the right person. So that's, so part of it is, is that a lot of the operations problems are actually caused in the sales process. They're actually caused in, um, what you're selling to who and what they're getting because that determines how much they're willing to pay the price you're able to pay to, to, to charge. Right. And it, it also depends on how much they're willing to pay up front. So if your offer is not very compelling, the best you're going to be able to get is this, these crazy net 30 terms, which means that you're, <laughs> that you're being a finance company for these, for these companies you're working with. Right. Um, but when you have a really great service that they can't find anywhere else, or they don't see that they can, they can create, get the same outcomes with any other client or with, with any other, um, company, rather any other agency, then you're, you're now, um, able to say, well, you know what, this is what we require up front. Or if you're the kind of company that says, you know what, we require the full investment up front, you get to choose your terms and that fixes your cash flow issue. But you've got to be really good to be able to do that. So I would say for companies under seven figures, focus on your results. Focus on your results. Focus on your on your results and get better and better outcomes for clients. Okay. So she gave y'all the general. So now we talked about 200 to 500. You're 600 or I guess 500 to a million people. This is when you consider taking them on. What is the difference between them, you saying like, okay, I'm willing to take a chance and work with you versus we know under 500 is, we're not even going to, God bless you, we'll we'll, we'll talk to you later. Yeah, yeah. if you're, if, if, if uh, you come to us and you've read our book, you understand our whole system and and you're like, you know what, I'm investing ahead of my company. I have this cash set aside. I I, I consider your company like a funded, a funded company. That's a completely different picture because you're saying I'm building a multi-million dollar company and I want to do it faster. That's a different situation. Almost no one thinks that way or has the ability to, so they have to just put more of their time and energy and sweat into it. But, um, all right. So, so at half a million, how we evaluate the companies that we work with is can they generate results? Can they actually generate results? Otherwise, what we're doing is we're going to teach them how to sell in a way that is going to be so effective. And then they're going to screw over their clients. So, um, they have to, so our process only works for companies that create a big transformation. So, um, they have to have case studies. They don't necessarily have to have them all articulated, but the result can't be peace of mind. That's not a result. And, um, that's not going to get the same kind of transformation that the, um, are you there with me, Cameron? <laughs> I'm listening. The results can't be peace of mind. Keep going. Oh, sorry. All right. I didn't well, want to blow up my computer because the charger was full and I was like, oh. Sure, I totally caught it. I didn't know. I was just, um, I thought maybe you were offline or something. No, nope. but All right. um, peace of mind. Now, okay. No, so, I'm, I'm ready for yeah. this one because you see a lot of people say that that is what you should sell. That selling peace of mind is a strong enough uh, reason for people to close with you, but you're saying yeah. it's not. So I'm, I'm ready to hear it. 
No, it's it's definitely not. Well, here's the other thing too, is it's and even just increased traffic, leads, on none of those things, like how do we know they're good leads? How do we know this is good traffic? You could just here's the thing is is that um if you can't show a clear pathway for how they're gonna get a return on investment working with you, then you can only expect the client to give you an investment at the level of throwing spaghetti against the wall. Because they're gambling. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, say that again. Hold up. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, is that if you can't you can't clearly show a path to success and a path to an ROI working with you. What you're going to get is clients, very timid clients, who are going to be investing in your services in the same way that they would be gambling. Because they're gambling, not investing. Because they they can't, and, and here's why referrals are, are really good and why a lot of agencies uh, um, rely on referrals is because when um, when the business has been referred, and this is a, this is an option that you know someone else has already gotten a result with. They're not gambling. They've made an, the, the introduction has been made, and they can they can over that. But you can't sell that cold. And so if you think that you have a, a so so those agencies who think that they have a compelling message, whether it's um, like we're going to help you make your marketing better or peace of mind, or, you know, we're going to take all of this off of your plate. This is a lot of time. We're just going to take it all off the plate. For yeah, you. We're, we're going to give you that time back, which helps you to make more money. Yeah. But you know what? Guess what? AI tools also give you time back. How are you going to compete against that? Also, you know what? They, they have, they have agencies that are coming up, popping up all over the world. This is becoming, there is going to be a bloodbath in the next three years, two to three years for agencies any agency that cannot actually show, like they're they're not true experts that are that are just turning the crank, that are that have have their one little thing that they're they're okay at, but they're not actually taking a stand for client results and being that growth partner. They will get washed out. They will get washed out by technology. They'll get washed out by commoditizing, economic commoditization from um, companies and and over overseas markets being able to being able and willing to do it for cheaper. Um, this has been this has been a long time coming for the past five years. I've been observing this even more, but we have clients these days that are getting like or agency clients are getting pickier and choosier. And they're, and especially with, you know, we're entering a place where many people would say that we're kind of in a recession. The behavior of 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 buyers certainly is indicating that they're they're cautious, they're nervous. So what that means is that they're not going to pay for solutions. Uh, they're certainly not going to pay for high level solutions, high level price point solutions that they um, they don't have a high level of certainty that they're going to get. So what ends up happening is, is that you have this scenario where clients are only willing to pay a very small amount. And um, then you have a, a situation where now this now the the owner of the business of the, of the agency owner has to have to has to be like, working their butt off to try to um, prove their worth and their value. But the problem is, is now this client is expecting to pay this low amount. They're also expecting the CEO to continue to be like busting their butt, servicing their client, their, 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 um, their account. So what have you done is you've, you've just brought on a client that has completely trapped the CEO in the business and made it even that much harder to grow the company. And there's not enough, there's just not, it's not even that profitable of a client. And you, you add in a few more clients that way, you know, 10 more clients down the line. And now you can see why the, these companies, they grow. They may reach seven figures doing this, by the way. A lot of them do. But then they're at seven figures. At their, that's They enter that seven-figure slump. That's that next growth stage. A slump at seven figures? Yeah, there's a slump at seven figures. It's not, it's not the uh, – here's the thing is, is that – so many agencies think that the the the, the like um, the promised land is seven figures. Actually, <laughs> right in the early seven figures, it is uh, it is rough. And I'll tell you, when we were going through this stage in our own company, I mean, I knew all this stuff. I'd helped hundreds of companies get through this stage, but it doesn't keep you from going through the same issue yourself, right? Um, 
so what because what happens at seven figures is you need to you need to install the management in place because what ends up happening is you've done all this delegation you've hired all these people around you and now you have you're kind of playing monkey in the middle where like you have all these balls being thrown at you you're catching them throwing them back and and it's incredibly stressful and there's a lot of agency owners that will just bow out around this stage and um it, at this at this stage, I, and I, I these type of symptoms can happen earlier than that too. It can happen in um, in in the you know leading up to seven figures. But what we see happen is is until they get that management layer in place, is that they will they'll go between somewhere between eight and nine hundred thousand up to about one point one one point three million, and it. Um, they just bounce back and forth between that for years and their profit. They've had never had a higher level of stress responsibilities, the number of clients, but at the same time, their profitability is really low and it's lower than they even know. And this is why they need people like you, Cameron, because they're um, the financial acumen of agency owners is lacking. That is it's important. It's important. To see that. You can't scale a company without understanding how your numbers work. Yeah, without understanding that, they, that you have to understand that, for example, if you could if you could be making two hundred thousand dollars a year at um, in a job that includes benefits and all that, and if you're paying yourself a hundred thousand dollars a year, and um, you're let's say that you 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 claim you have a twenty percent profit. <laughs> You don't have a 20% profit. You may even be negative profit. Numbers don't lie. And neither does Mandy. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so anyway, that, that, so at that seven figures, at that seven figure place, you need to get an operations manager. Now here's the things, another example where you think, oh, well, I can't afford this. I don't have, I don't have this. So first of all, what is it going to take for you to afford this? Okay. You need to look at if I had this person in place, how much more time is it going to free me up to go out and sell? How much more capacity will this give our team to go generate and bring on more clients? Because a lot of times there's a capacity crunch that happens right here where they don't have the cat, they don't have the cash flow to hire the people, but they don't have the capacity to go out and bring in more sales. So they're really stuck at this place. It's rough. So what they need to do is, is first of all, vision it forward. What, what is possible if we have this role in place? So you understand how much it, is it costing you every month to not have this role in place? And then when you're looking at that, you're like, okay, I'm, I'm going to find the money to do that. And then when you're saying, I'm going to find the money, you're going to say, okay, what is it going to take? How many new sales do I need to make? And now all of a sudden you're like on fire and bringing on the next, the next sale. And maybe, maybe you're not willing to do it for any less than this amount. So you have the money that you need to hire the next person. Um, but there's an even better thing here too. We, what we do with our clients is we actually help them hire really good operations managers in different markets. So Eastern Europe is one of our favorite places to ha to hire operations managers and other leaders. Whoa, so you can whoa, find whoa, someone. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Great. You can't just drop yeah. it like that and keep going. Okay. <laughs> Eastern Europe, not the Philippines, not Latin, not South America. Eastern okay. Europe. Yes, Eastern Europe, because it's Europe. Their education is every bit as good as ours. And the um, the culture is similar. Their English is really good for the most part. You have to qualify like any other any other place, but you can find really good leaders that... Um, one of my favorite things about Eastern Europe is they're so outspoken. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, the Europeans in general, what I've found is Europeans in general are actually more outspoken than Americans, if you can believe that. So what that means is you have a leader there who's going to say, no, that's not the right thing to do. <laughs> and, and they're going to give pushback. Whereas the American employee is like, okay. <laughs> okay. So let's go. It's a gross generalization. Gross generalization. Right. And that does not always fit the case. Let's right? stand, no, I'm I have this. Let's stay in the growth. So, because we've talked about this on a couple of episodes where it's super important to understand the culture of the people you're going to bring on. So we all know U.S. people, goes without saying. 
So would you say in you suggesting which positions they may need to bring on so they can keep working themselves out? Hey, we found that most people from the Philippines do really well, really well in this. I don't know why I'm saying that wrong. Really well in this kind of role and not well in this one. Same thing for LATAM. So can you give us maybe a, maybe a breakdown that you've seen like LATAM people kill it in this role and et cetera? Um, I think I think that there's there's some of that you can look at and know that the, the culture is going to be more uh, conducive for some roles than others. Um, it's going to vary person by person. And you know what? I think you're going to be able to find people from the Philippines who could, who could be good operations managers. The time difference for me is like it's. It's so different. I, I want so I want someone to be a little closer in the time zone, even um, just because you're 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 completely half the world apart on that. Um, and and they have a culture that is a little bit more. Um, they're, they're really wonderful, happy people. And um, but they're but they're not people who are going to be the ones that will get pushed back a lot. So for when when you need a leader who's going to give you a lot of pushback i you have less of a pool of people doing that that have that personality and it's the personality everyone's different right but you can find in general in you, you can find a generalization of certain cultures that will um like americans show up a certain way i mean we 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 do we're a little bolder and louder and um everybody knows around the world that that's kind of what we're like and Canadians and Americans even are a little different. The culture there, I grew up in Canada and um, the culture in Canada is different than, than the United States. How so how for the people who've never been to Canada? Canada? Pardon me? For the people who've never been to Canada, what would you say is that difference? Because maybe their person is in Canada and they just don't know it. They're, well, they, well um, many of the, the Commonwealth countries from the UK, um, they have a little, they have this thing called tall poppy syndrome where um, they will cut down people who get ahead. So there, there is a bit of a culture there in, um, of like, don't get, don't, don't get further than anyone else. And there's, there's some wealth shaming that happens because it's, um, it's just, it's not a very, it's not as entrepreneurial friendly country as, as America is. Um, Okay, so yeah, so one that I've offended a few people. So you said Philippines, that's Canada slash UK. What about your Latin people? You know what? We've just been starting to do more hiring in that in that space. Um, I have I have someone on my team who's from Latin. He's amazing. Oh my gosh, amazing! You can have such, but just in general, I think it's hard to make more generalizations on this, and I don't think I wanted to be quoted as as mass generalizations on this because every market you can find the specialties and right, there's some right. people who are really good at hiring from the Philippines, for example, and they could, they can find, and, and you know, I'm going to be honest, I'm not a Filipino hiring expert. However, we have a lot of partners who are, and um, who will, will place people in the, for the, for the right circumstances. So it's, it's about finding the right partners for that too. But um, I will just say though, what some of our favorite, is is Eastern European hires. So I I'm gonna drop I'm gonna drop a little nugget here for your folks if if you'd like. But yeah, I don't usually yeah. share. Okay. This okay. is kind of one of our, okay. our one of our secret weapons. Um and uh I know Noel over at Job Rack is gonna appreciate me doing this. But Job Rack, you can, they will place Eastern European staff, all different kinds of staff. We love hiring operations managers there, but they 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 um they can do all sorts of staff and I think the placement fee is somewhere around forty five hundred. It's 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 just dirt cheap because when you look at someone that you can hire for half the price and who is every bit as educated and committed, that's where <laughs> it's a no brainer. So you can you can find really good teams. So if if anyone's listening here and you want to hire that next person, maybe an account manager or operations manager, you can definitely reach out to. Job rack, tell the Mandy Ellison from Hands Off CEO sent, or just Mandy that he'll know he'll know who I am. We work closely with them. Um, but you can talk with Noel and he'll even give you some feedback on it, on, on who to hire next. And then um then then the, the real opportunity and the challenge is now how do you how do you train them up? How do you get them so that within 90 days you could get them running your company? 
So when you're ready to do that, reach out to us and I'll sh we'll show you how. <laughs> That's when you make the phone call. Okay. Yeah. Man. Okay. Do you got five more, five more minutes for me? Yes. Uh, I think so. See, I told you I should be busy. See, we were having yeah. so much fun. I didn't even realize the time had passed. Yeah, we're good. We're good. I'm good okay. on time. Let I'm me, you. we'll kind of go rapid fire on these just so that we can try to get the most bang because we definitely want to honor your time. So let's go rapid fire. Best investment to date that has produced the greatest ROI. In my life or business? Either or. I think probably one of the biggest ROIs in um, in my life, which has contributed to my business dramatically, is I worked with a relationship coach named Bruce Music from Love at First Fight. And he helped me transform my relationship with my husband 10 years ago, uh, about 11 years ago. And um, it totally changed my life. And it it taught me how to create it, to take a stand for other people and um I just learned so much about myself there and I learned about taking a stand for other people boldly, even if they don't like it because <laughs> he took a stand for me and that's changed my life. Uh Oh, I think she froze, but she was saying shout out to Bay and the guy who helped their relationship. You're to breaking be up better. a little bit. I think we got some type of internet issues going. So I'm going to just keep talking until she comes back. Now, hopefully what you guys are understanding here is that there are stages to building your agency, right? There's that zero to 250, 250 to I can't, I can't understand you. You're all broken a million, up. A million to three million, et cetera. Shoot. Mm -hmm. I have no Are idea. You back? Open there. It said that we didn't have internet, but I most definitely still had internet. So that's a that's a new well. One. I, I I stayed on here to make sure that that you didn't lose the recording. All <laughs> right. Last I heard was you said you invested in a relationship coach helped you stay married to Bay. Yeah. Okay. That's pretty much. Do you want me to say it? All right. Let's keep going. Rapid Thank fire. Since you've seen this, top three things that you would tell a new agency to do to get to their million dollars faster. Um, yeah, top three things. The top three things is be unbelievably good. Provide amazing results. Focus on results. Focus on getting case studies from results and leverage your fees to be able to charge the highest amount that you can for your services for outcomes. And then that will allow you to be able to get there faster than any, anything else you'll do. Okay. That's one, that's one, right? Well, I guess there was, yeah, there, I was going to say the, 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 the results with the case studies, I guess that's one, um, hire an operations manager faster, hire faster. Okay. Um, and, um, and focus on take actions aligned with who, uh, with the identity of who, of who you need to be, let me let me rephrase this. Take actions aligned with the, with your vision for where where you actually want to be. If you want to have a ten million dollar company, show up as a ten million dollar CEO right now today. You'll get there a lot faster. 
I want to stay right there for a hot second. When you say if you want to be a million dollar company, see yourself as a ten million dollar company so that you show up faster. Well, not necessarily. I'm just using an example of if you're being at a ten million. There's not everyone needs to be at a ten million dollar company, but if you want if but if you want a million dollar company, you need to start showing up as a million dollar CEO right away. And by the way, we only work with clients who are able to choose. They're 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 willing to choose to stand in to step into that right there. Even if they're not there, you need to step into that. Because some people are gonna be like, "Well, I am a million dollar agency. I just haven't made the money yet." Like, how would you explain what well, stepping into that looks like? Well, what that stepping into it it means is that is to align your actions with someone of, of who you need to be the actions you need to take aligned with a million dollar company. So what that means is not saying, Hey, you know what? I'm at, I'm at a half a million dollar, um, half a million dollars this year. I want to get to a million dollars over the next 12 months, but you know what? Let's wait until next quarter to talk about investing in my company. That's an example of not really showing up as a million dollar CEO. That's, that's an example of acting out of fear and I mean, there's certainly there's times time has got to be right, but don't go and put together this really big growth goal, which, by the way, adding five hundred thousand dollars at that stage is a big, pretty big growth goal. Adding five hundred thousand if you're at three million dollars is tiny. That's not very big at all. But with it, relatively, that's a really big goal. So if you say you want to get there. Get the support that you need to actually get there. Hmm. That's okay. what I mean. That's an example of one of the ways. An okay. example of one of the ways also to invest is to is to learn how to be a better leader. Another other example of those is is to watch your numbers, to educate yourself on 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 the financial side of your business. Million dollar CEOs understand the finances in their business. So if if you if you don't if you want a million dollar company, you've got to be willing to do things that million dollar companies do. Okay. Let's do, what are some things that you do to connect with your husband throughout the week? Cause I know you're working super hard. You're saving the world. How do you keep that balance? Is there like a date night that um, you guys do? We do a date night. And the thing that we do when it's a little cooler is we go in the hot tub every night. So that's our time to just kind of connect and chat. And um, then together as a family, we say prayers at night have dinner at night. So those are the ways that we, we connect as a family, just bare minimum. We do more than that, but that's the hot tub. Our hot tub time is a big deal. There you go. All right. If you could get in a time machine and you had 30 seconds to go back to high school, Mandy, and you know, everything that's happened today, like everything, nothing changed. You just got enough time to go back. What do you tell her? I tell her you're awesome. And you can do way more than you possibly can imagine. Mm. Okay. What has being a business and, owner? And don't don't be weird. Don't don't have any problem being your weird, funky, unusual self. Right now, it's it, it doesn't serve you well because you're, the world does not like that you sticking out. But it will serve you very well later on. Okay. What has being a business owner taught you about yourself? Like you, the person. I, I don't understand the question. Could you ask it again, please? So what has being a business owner taught you about who Mandy is as a person? So like in, we've had some people say, um, man, it taught me that I'm super impatient, you know, or whatever the case. Yeah, I, I think I've always known that. <laughs> but um, it, it, it's taught me that I'm really determined and that um, I'm pretty unstoppable, that I will, I will, uh, I'm really good at failure. I'm, I'm really good at getting knocked down about a thousand times more than a normal person will do, will get up from. Okay. That's what success is. It's just getting up more, more times than most people will. You don't even have to be the smartest person. You just have to be able to be able, be able to learn from your mistakes and, and not let it, uh, not let it break you down. Okay. All right, child. Well, we, we've taken extra time from her. We knows that she's going to have to go and continue to save the world. Now, Mandy, tell people if they want to connect with you, if they want to find you on social websites, what do you do? Name of the company again. How can they reach out? How can they get the book? This is your yeah. time to tell them all of that. 
Yeah, um, you can find a copy of our book, at Hands Off CEO. Um, if the Hands Off CEO is you know, on Amazon, if you if you would like to have a scalability checklist with exact roles that um, who to hire next and how exactly to be scaling your company from, I will say from one to ten million. But if you're below that, you still will get a lot of value out of um, be, of, of the steps that you missed. Um, go to handsoffceo.com forward slash checklist, and you can download a whole agency scaling checklist. And um, it's, I'll tell you, the company is here at six figures. If they just listen, if they go back and listen to my podcast, if they read this book, they will be able to get so much farther, so much faster. This is what I wish I would have had when I was an agency at this size. I used to have an agency. That's how I got into this. I got into this by blowing up my life, my personal life by attempting to scale my agency. And it was rough. It was really bad. Um, I talk about that in the book, but, um, anyone who has, uh, you know, if they, they want to, they want to share where they're at, I'd be happy to send it. So you can send me an email, Mandy at, um, handsoffceo.com. So Mandy with an I and, um, yeah, like keep, keep up the good fight and don't go do really good work. Dang, I, I feel bad that we didn't even get into the fact that you had an agency before and how you transitioned. <laughs> Dang. No, don't worry about it. We talked about a lot of things. Man. Okay. Well, y'all, as you see, this episode was really good. I think she did a perfect job of really kind of showing the distinctions between each of those kind of three or four stages of the business. What kind of separates one from the next one? So if that was you, we didn't know it was you. We were just having a conversation. You know what they say, if the shoe fits, wear it. It's okay. Just pray and be like, oh, Lord, help me to do better or help me to buy the book so that I can read and see what I can improve on or fix to get to that next stage. You can do that. So if you know somebody who needs this episode, tag them, share it, suggest this to them, send them the link. Of course, you know, we're on Apple Music, Spotify, YouTube, wherever. But I think this was a good thing. And just to kind of recap, for all of you who may have zoned out, you know, you was cleaning the house, doing dishes, yelled at the kids, just in super short summer. Mandy's a beast. She's helped plenty of people get not only two seven figures, but go from seven to eight figures, which I low key feel like we didn't even get to that part really. So we may need a part two, but that's a different one. But there are different stages, and a lot of it at those beginning stages, the zero to 250, the 250 to 500, is dealing with a lot of mental trash, having to get past the fact of whatever your past traumas and triggers are and to be able to go all in and believe in the fact that I can be a million dollar agency, that 500 to a million mark. That's where you're really starting to step into that role and are really starting to realize who you are. And most importantly, it comes down to the choice of, am I really willing to take the financial leap to make the big investment, whether that's in the ops person or somebody like Mandy, to really get you where you need to go. It's the big leaps and commitment to yourself. And of course, we know you have to be on point with your fulfillment, your product, your service, have systems in place. That goes without saying at this point. So we talked about that. So again, y'all, check it out. The book is right there, the hands-off CEO. We're going to put the link in here so you can get it. We know y'all got $10 because if you go to Starbucks, that's basically $10. So just don't go to Starbucks one day, get the book, and then, you know, you, you hit her up on social, and there you go. So with all that being said, we thank you guys. Mandy, any last words? Nope, I think you said it just fine. All right. Well, with all that being said, guys, until the next episode, we're dedicated to finding you the best guests to bring you guys value. Until the next episode, stay safe and see you.